When people think sometimes I'm exaggerating if I'm saying it actually hurts to be alone, hurts to be separated, to be banished, to be disconnected. Think about this, which hurts more, a broken arm or a broken heart? So that's the general approach in which I, I look at the topic of loneliness. Just a few more words, taking a look, because you asked about what is likely to happen, what's my prediction of what's likely to happen, what problems, psychological issues might arise from all this social distancing we all are taking in an effort to stay safe from the coronavirus. And I think to answer that, I'd like to break it into three age groups. Good afternoon. Welcome to Cambridge Forum, coming to you live from Zoom. I'm Mary Stack, the director of Cambridge Forum, and today I'm very pleased to welcome back a former guest of Cambridge Forum, J.W. Freiburg, or Terry, who's going to help us discuss the topic of lockdown Americans, isolation and loneliness in the 21st century. Social distancing is hard on us because we humans are social animals and we are bioelectronically wired for connection. While the present pandemic didn't cause the isolation that characterizes our era, it has certainly exacerbated it. In 2018, 28% of adult households in the United States were single person households. 63% of the adult population remained unmarried but apparently we're not happier. On the contrary, 35% of adult Americans report themselves to be chronically lonely. This is up 20% from 1990. Terry Freiberg's latest book, Surrounded by Others and Yet So Alone, looks at the problem of chronic loneliness through his unique lens as a social psychologist and lawyer. His case studies are infused with the latest brain science, which reveals that loneliness is actually a sensation like thirst or hunger, not an emotion like anger, which you can talk yourself out of. So Terry, tell us a little bit about why you wrote this book and maybe how we can get through surmounting this current crisis. Well, I suppose I wrote this book because I didn't write it two years ago, uh, four years ago, I should say, when I wrote a book uh, called Four Seasons of Loneliness, which talked or presented stories about people who were chronically lonely because they were so isolated and disconnected. I, what I left out and had to write a second book to cover was, well, wait a minute, half of all lonely people, uh, chronically lonely people, we know from our studies, come from connected backgrounds. They're married, they have kids, they have other family, they have friends, they have workmates and teammates, and neighbors. Why are they lonely? Well, it has to do with misconnections, with failed relationships. So I needed to write this second book in order to correct the fact that I left all this out of my previous book. Okay, so misconnection. Um... If you're in a relationship and you have a family, you could still be misconnected from people. Right. And let me back up a moment, if I might, Mary, and just give um, a little talk, as you asked about, um, uh, in general, just to bring everyone up to the same uh, conversational level so we can all participate in the answer, uh, question and answer period about how I conceive of loneliness. Uh, uh, for me, it is a sensation, as you said, like hunger and thirst. It comes from the parietal lobe of our brain, which is us as an animal, as mammals. We are pod-oriented, family-based, small group mammals, like some of the great apes, like elephants, and like the cetaceans, the whales, the dolphins, and the porpoises. We, we actually physiologically have, uh, and evolutionarily, have been together in these small groups from time immemorial. And it hurts when we're separated from each other, just as it hurts when you're hungry and you're thirsty. It's driving us and our other fellow mammals to get together, stay in the grouping. That's where safety, nurturing lay. And so we are actually in pain when we hurt. And there's some very interesting recent physiological research, which shows the uh, uh, region in the um, 
in the frontal lobe of the brain called the cingulate uh, that has uh, the task of interpreting incoming physical pain when you stub your toe, when you burn your finger. It's a very important neural pathway, obviously, because it leads to the brain assigning other part, this part of the brain, assigning other parts to get you to move your finger or grab your aching toe and, and deal with your pain or injury. There's only one other task to this cingulate, and that is that it carries the pain of banishment, the pain of disconnection. So it's called social pain overlap theory, and it's absolutely fascinating. A recent uh, um, bioelectronic discovery of brain and brain research. So why would this be so important? Why would evolutionarily this important neural pathway be dedicated to disconnection at the same time it has the critically important task of organizing our reaction to incoming pain? Well, that's because it was dangerous to be alone. And it's painful to be alone as a signal to you to go do something about it, to reconnect. And by the way, when people think sometimes I'm exaggerating if I'm saying it actually hurts to be alone, hurts to be separated, to be banished, to be disconnected. Think about this, which hurts more, a broken arm or a broken heart? So that's the general approach in which I, I look at the topic of loneliness. Just a few more words, taking a look, because you asked about what is likely to happen, what's my prediction of what's likely to happen, what problems, psychological issues might arise from all this social distancing we all are taking in an effort to stay safe from the coronavirus. And I think to answer that, I'd like to break it into three age groups, the elderly, working adults, and our children. I don't think I've seen a sadder picture uh, in memory uh, than senior citizens in senior care homes, which are so threatened by this virus, looking out the window at their adult children who cannot come in to visit them, even when they are in the process of entering their final days. We made a promise to these senior citizens when we separated them. Let's remember that for the entirety of human history up to two generations ago, elderly people lived with their families and families were multi-generational. That's why we have to pay for elder care on one hand and child care on the other. Usually, the I should say in history, the grandparents took care of the grandchildren and we didn't have that. But we've now invented this concept of separating the senior citizens and putting them together in these retirement homes. And we made them a promise to visit. Don't worry, grandma, don't worry, dad. We'll be visiting plenty. I know you don't know these people, but you'll have lots of visitation. Well, up shows the coronavirus and we cannot fulfill that promise. How sad that is. So the level of chronic loneliness amongst these people is going to skyrocket, I would predict. And we actually have some uh, preliminary uh, study on that that seems to uh, back up that case. So what about working age people? How are they going to be affected by this? Well, there's a million subtopics one could go off into. Um, but let me just pick one so that I speak just a little bit of time and save uh, the lion's share of time for our question and answer period. And that is touch, the issue of touch. I've uh, just written an article soon to be published that, uh, that's called COVID-19, now we've really lost touch. Mm -hmm. So this word touch is a fascinating word because in the Latin languages, to be touched has two meanings. It means to be physically touched and it means to be emotionally touched. That's true in French, with the, the verb toucher is used just the same. It's the same in Spanish with tocar, that's just the same. And it's the same in German. The uh, word root in German, uh, to be physically touched, uh, berühren, is the same root as rührend, which is the uh, verb that you use when you're emotionally touched. So what's going on here? Why, why is, is it so important that this loss of touch is going to be experienced by all of us. It's because of the type of mammals we are. We are animals, we're pod type herd animals. We've all seen uh, deer or cattle uh, or horses uh, or dogs or cats, other mammals 
brush up against each other. They nurture their young. Obviously, they nurse their young, but they also lick them and, 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 and they can't hold them. They don't have arms and hands, but they brush against them. That's who we are. So the loss of touch is going to be a very serious issue coming out of this, one of many. Um, and, but I want to leave that for the question and answer period. And finally, just to conclude this very brief little introduction, I want to talk about children and the effect this might have on little children. So children learn to learn to re, uh, their relational skills in, in two phases. The first phase is when they're tiny babies. From one minute, of, not even a minute old, a baby is placed up on his mother's chest and breast. Uh, the father's petting him these modern days when the, since he's in the room. Um, and from then on, it's all about hugs and kisses and nurturing and soothing, kissing that bruised knee, stroking the head of a young child, sitting on the edge of the bed, reading stories, taking the back of your hand and rubbing down their cheek. All of that loving touch and nurturing that we put into raising children is training our children. I won't go into the internal physiology of it unless someone's interested, but we do understand how this nurturing brings forth the endogenous opioids um, and dopamine and ser serotonin. There are actually chemicals in our brains that, are, that come forth when we touch and nurture and love one another. And we train our children to connect with others, to go make friends, to then make later in life, to make um, even mates and to raise children. We train them just as certainly as birds train their young to fly and other animals train their, train their young in, in their life necessities. So that's phase one of children building and learning how to go connect with others on their own as they move out of the nest step by step. But phase two is the one that's going to be affected by the COVID-19 quarantine. And that's what we call free play. When children have unstructured play with one another on the playground, during recess at school, on the streets of their neighborhood when they knock on the door and ask Benny to come out and play some catch with them or whatever, um, in summertime, the infinite length of childhood summertime, playing a million made up silly games with circles of friends, all of that safe space when children free play without adult supervision or much adult monitoring is when they practice their relational skills. That's how they get better at making new friends, at deepening friendships, also at dealing with rejection. We all remember high school, but those are important lessons. And at, for example, recognizing and dealing with the local bully. All of those lessons are learned from free play time that children have with each other. I worry about the fact that children, I assume, are going to be let out in the coming weeks or months and told, I'm sorry, but you can't touch your friends, you need to wear a mask, you need to stay six feet apart. It's going to be a very different word, world for children, and I worry about the effects it will have on their social skills. Which brings us to a really easy segue. Uh, you used the word connect. First, you talked about the different permutations of touch, but connect, one tends to think of a hand reaching out, you know, the, that famous poster of the two fingers coming together. But in fact, connect has come to mean more and more digital connection. So do you think that the tools that we have, such as we're using today, have mitigated some of the problem, or do you just think they've exacerbated it? Having all these digital tools, whether they've become a substitute for real interaction? I think it's both. I think it's a complicated question, uh, a brilliant question, but I think it's a complicated answer. Obviously, we've all seen uh, teenagers buried into their cell phones to the point where they could care less that the parents have taken them over to Paris and they're standing in front of the Eiffel Tower and they're not looking at it. And they couldn't care less about it. They want to see whether Billy responded to their last text. So sure, they can be misused, no question about it. And for that matter, the loneliest quintile of our population, and we have some very powerful testing tools for this, 
is Generation uh, Z and uh, Gen X that they score more lonely than the senior citizens in those um, depraved, uh, sometimes and deprived uh, senior care homes. So there's serious thought to be put into that. On the other side of the coin, the media do allow us to connect with one another from a distance. And obviously they can be used in a healthy fashion. I'm always telling people that it's just as important to work on the maintenance of your relationships as it is the maintenance of your car or your vacuum cleaner or anything else. Everything has maintenance involved, including relationships. And it's ever more important as the world becomes ever more atomized. Historically, our great, all of our great-great-grandparents or triple-great-grandparents lived in small settings, in, in villages or in small towns or in ethnic concentrations in small cities. And you grew up around a circle of people who you knew. For example, everybody in the classical world grew up around their siblings and their first cousins and second cousins and remained connected to these people throughout their lives. Now, in uh, the new book, I mentioned some of the statistics, people are very separated from their cousins because there's so much mobility to find jobs and for other reasons that people get separated. So these new media allow us to reconnect. And so they have a very positive role to play. At the same time with teenagers, they have apparently the opposite effect. And I might mention that FaceTime, Zoom, and the others that allow facial content are very important because one of the human connective skills is called mirroring. It's how we do empathy. It's how we read into somebody else's expression and body language, how they're really feeling, what's behind their words. So mirroring skills are very important and they are possible to some extent, to some significant extent, I would say, when you have, as we're doing now, the, the facial expressions behind the words. So I think the media can play a, a, a negative role, but also an important positive role. Like many things, it's a matter of using them wisely. It was very interesting. Uh, we had Sherry Turkle on, who's you know the maestro about how our behavior is shaped by tools. Uh, and last year she was saying that they already know that texting in teenagers has caused a lack of a decrease in empathy because you know, there's no, as you say, there's no facial recognition. You're not deciphering unspoken emotion. And she said, well, they've already created a new app for empathy. <laughs> so the answer was yet another app to try and fix it. Anyway, um, I, you just made me think of something there. You talked about sensorial aspects there, about the physical touch. And we now know that one of the side effects also that can be malingering from COVID is lack of smell and uh, taste, which um, that's another interesting deficit that um, will change our perception of the world, how we view the world and how we, I mean, you know, it's a great image to me of when elephants are taking care of each other. And even when they're mourning, they use their trunk both, you know, as a sensory thing and a smelling tool to, to actually remember the smell of their ancestry. I mean, smelling is very important in terms of bonding between humans as well as animals. So let's hope we don't lose that as well and, and hope that that is temporary, that loss of uh, smell. Okay, so let's go back to some of the downsides that's happened that we know of in this pandemic, which is um, increase in um, abuse. Um, I saw the BBC last night or PBS, um, a doctor saying that twice as many ch uh, child abuse cases coming into the emergency room, um, women also, but they're not being reported to the police. Um, they're just turning up. So, there's this other long-term effect, not just of the physical um, injury and the psychological harm, but the fact that you can't be in a safe place and you can't report it because that means going back to the offender in most cases now. I mean, they're not going to have too many options for putting you in another safe place. So we have a very complex kind of web of interconnection with this 
that we can't even measure, right? I think that's absolutely true. Mm. What, one of the uh, stories, because my books are, are presented as stories, uh, same issues we're talking about, but I like to present them as stories from real law cases that came, came through my office. And one of them was, um, I'll tell you the story because it's right along the lines you were talking about. I lived in a neighborhood in uh, Boston that had uh, no bakery worth eat, eat shopping at. And all of a sudden this delightful French bakery opened up. It just changed the life of the neighborhood. And the a couple of dead stores on each side, one became a coffee shop and one became a children's toy store. It was absolutely delightful little insertion into a, an otherwise uninteresting neighborhood. Everything was fine and it, it just heavenly for six months. And then the bread was no good. The crust wasn't crunchy. It had lost its flavor. It tasted salty. I just thought, okay, bad day, bad week, whatever. So then it improved again. That was fine. After about three of these up and downs, I finally, thick-headed me, figured out that the principal baker who owned and ran the place was, a, was an abused spouse. And when she was hurting from home, mm. her bread was salty and tasteless. And, and the helpers she had in the store were just uh, deadpan. The, the delight of good times became the uh, mourning uh, feeling of a funeral home. And so I set out to learn about domestic abuse, which I hadn't known anything about whatsoever, really. And so I came, I got involved in the case to sort of rescue her. And that's the fifth and final story in the new book. Um, but what's important here is to understand that um, abusive relationships are still connections. And that and one of the hardest things to do is to talk abused, usually wives. It's sometimes I had one case once where it was the six foot two husband who was abused by the five foot two or three wife. So it's psychological power actually more than physical power. But at any rate, it's usually the wife who suffers the blows. Why don't they leave? Why is it so hard to talk them into leaving an awful circumstance? Because it's a type of connection. It's, it's a misconnection. That's why I write about it in the book. Uh, but it's a type of connection. So it's not so, always so easy to get people to A, report, and B, to do something about even, uh, even connections that are dangerous, uh, let alone um, uh, neglectful. Is this something that you think could, well, certainly we talked about the possibility that lawyers um, might benefit from some serious psychological training in terms of understanding clients, victims, the whole scenario that they're confronting in the courtroom. But also, is this something that, that, that we could all benefit from being taught about in school? How to navigate and recognize a good relationship how to maintain it, which like you said, maintain your car, maintain a relationship, and then how to recognize if something is not correct and needs reporting or, or dealing with. Absolutely. Um, and um, there's, there's a brilliant body of work that's really helpful on this. Um, Dr. Amy Banks, um, who's a psychiatrist in the Boston area, uh, and she comes from a school of thought um, and I, I knew the person who started that school back in the 70s, Jean Baker Miller, and it had, it has, it's called relational therapy. And its basic theory is that one very important element of mental health is a good and working set of relationships. And they're specialized in helping people deal with relationship issues. Some people are unskilled at forming relationships and keeping them and deepening them. Remember I spoke earlier about how you need a loving set of parents to get you started along the track of relational skills. And then you need a, a good set of, of um, adolescent uh, um, relationships. So you learn the, the do's and don'ts of being involved in friendships. And then you, you also need to not be traumatized en route because that can knock you off the tracks even if you got a good start from your parents and, and childhood relationships. But this, this uh, capacity to form relationships is so central that it, it, can, uh, it can be addressed therapeutically. It's not easy. We're just learning how. Same with trauma. Because when, when a soldier, uh, let me just take one moment, if I might, and compare trauma and loneliness. 
So when we all are familiar with post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, the idea that soldiers can come back from war deeply, deeply psychologically wounded by what they've seen and what they've done. And we, and the last 30 years of trauma research and therapy has worked out the reality that you can't deal with these issues with just talk therapy because the memories of the trauma are stored somatically in the body. And that's the other side of the coin of saying loneliness is a sensation. The pain of loneliness is not an idea, it's a feeling. And so therapists uh, are going to need to begin to do what trauma therapists have done, to work with people who've suffered a great amount of loneliness is to learn to use somatically based theory along with uh, talk therapy to try and deal with these issues. So yes, there are things that can be done. We're uh, over in the clinical side of things, we're learning more and improving our skill sets. And there are some therapists who specialize in that. Fascinating. Okay, I wanted to ask you about, um, the, the, I don't know if people are, are ready to talk about this, but one of the questions that I put in, in the questionnaire was this very question that you talked about. Have you suffered more from, do you think you suffer more from a broken heart than from a broken arm? And I would be very interested to know what people think about that, if they want to come in with comments or, I see a question down here. Um, okay, this is not in connection with this particular question. Uh, but anyone who wants to chime in on that, that suffering the effects of having perhaps both a broken heart and having suffered a broken limb. Um, Tim Weiskel has said, um, many are drawn to read your book surrounded by others. They've also read the book by Robert Putnam called Bowling Alone. This book is expected to be printed uh, later this year in a revised form. How would you best describe the differences in approach taken by yourself and Mr. Putnam discussing the phenomenon of social isolation or alienation and isolation in America. Well, Robert Putnam's book was, as far as I know, the first book uh, to really center on the issue of loneliness and how it's being generated in modern society. And he pointed out that in his, historical times, um, in the community settings I was talking about, when you grew up and you knew everyone in your life, everyone in your community was known to you or one step removed, um, there wasn't social space for loneliness. That loneliness is something that modern society is producing. And apparently it keeps the, the rate at which we uh, record uh, how much chronic loneliness there is keeps going up year by year. And we have some a very powerful test on that called the UCLA loneliness scale, which is very valid and reliable. It's been tested many times. So his, his work uh, is, was of key importance in, in getting uh, others of us interested in this topic, seeing it as a topic that required research and, and further thought. Um, it's interesting you talk about the, um, this being a modern phenomenon because um, of course this situation has, people that have already suffered from mental anxiety and stress have upped the problem. But of course, even people that are pretty healthy most of the time, psychologically, are, have bad days in this pandemic where they feel very cut off or will life ever be the same again? So somebody here, Urs, has actually written in a very interesting question, address the difference between loneliness, isolation and solitude. Absolutely, brilliant question. The, my uh, previous book on loneliness, Four Seasons of Loneliness, the very first line in the book is, this book is about loneliness, not solitude. We're blessed in English with these two words uh, that are, because they're quite different. Uh, so we all appreciate the fact that people can uh, decide to live alone and be quite successful at it and not feel pangs of loneliness and carry on their lives as they want. That's, that, that's not at issue. What we're talking about is people who don't want to be alone, but find themselves um, alone and incapable of making new relationships to get out of that problem. Step two, I want to say is, I definitely want to distinguish loneliness 
from chronic loneliness. We are all alone from time to time. How could we not be? When we're in our 20s or 30s, we lose our grandparents. When we're in our 50s or 60s, on average, we lose our parents, our uncles, our aunts. Friends move away, especially in this highly mobile society. Um, and people die and you lose your friends that way. So we all suffer loss that leads to loneliness. That's part of being human. That's distinguished from people who are chronically lonely, people who are either devastatingly isolated or incapable of making and maintaining a, a nurturing and soothing relationship. That's chronic loneliness, a very different thing. It's very parallel to sadness and clinical depression. Mm. We're all sad from time to time, but we are not all clinically depressed. That's, that's a very interesting point about the level of degree. Um, oh, somebody's written in here. Broken bones are easy to fix. Conversely, the heart can create deep psychological damage that can last for decades. I can't say it better than that. <laughs> So going back to this, um, the antidote for this problem, um, I watched a program last night called The Quietest Place on Earth, which was a really very nice program. It was all shot in Maui and talked to various people about what they derived from nature and solitude. Uh, some were meditative, some were writers, some were poets. Um, and one guy said a very interesting thing. Of course, it doesn't apply so well right now, because we don't have control, as much control over our environment. But he said, as soon as I start to feel lonely, I think outside, I think of others. Because as soon as you start thinking of others, psychologically, you don't spend as much energy thinking about yourself. And even in meditation, it's not about self, it's about going outside of yourself, which I thought was uh, an interesting observation, even though it's hard to do. Because we can't just run out and buy someone a bunch of flowers. Well, I suppose you could when you go shopping right now and drop them off. But um, it's harder to do the impulsive little things that you would normally do. So are there any suggestions or do you have any advice for what we can do to, you know, put us in a better place or, or deal with this when we I, sense we are getting chronically lonely? Well, I, I do have a... a a report to make again from the work of, uh, of Amy Banks and the uh, relational uh, th uh, therapy kind of approach. She calls it positive relational moments, PRMs, positive relational moments. And it's incredibly useful. If, if, if each of us, if everybody thinking right now, er, sorry, if everybody listening right now, think of your best friend or friends and think of a magical moment that you had with some person very dear to your heart, whether it was a grandmother or a parent or a friend, think of a magnificent moment when you were absolutely relating to each other and understanding each other and felt nothing but warmth. Okay. That's called a positive relational moment. That's like a little pill. So keep that in mind and maybe have half a dozen of them cook up. <laughs> And next time you're spending time with someone who you have a relationship with, but it's stressful and tense, and you're trying to think about how do I avoid bucking back and just, and just um, augmenting the argument that's starting to develop or something, use your PRM, take your pill, take your memory pill. Just go for a moment to that space and time when you were delighted inside of a relationship. And we've measured people, we've measured the physiological reaction to that. It changes breathing, it changes heart rate, you know, the muscles in your shoulders and neck relax. We've actually measured that. So it's an, an awful, wonderful trick. It's as free as the air we breathe. Use it. So tell us a little bit about your own background, um, Terry, because you, you've started off as a social psychologist um i think you were at bu um and then you made this transition into law so what prompted that and well i mean it was a bit of a coincidence at at boston university I, it's actually the stories in the uh the 2016 book, uh, Four Seasons of Loneliness. But I was one of the professors at Boston University who tried to get John Silver, 
uh, terminated because we didn't think he was doing a, a reasonable job at all. Uh, and um, so we didn't succeed. And so when I came up for tenure, I won my tenure, but I, I had made an enemy of the president of the university. So almost on a lark, I applied across the river to a small law school over in Cambridge. And lo and behold, they let me in. So now I had to choose. And for once in my life, I made a really good decision. I figured, um, you know what, I'm going to resign here and go to law school, which I did. And uh, when I came out of law school and went into a, a typical Boston big firm, um, I began to quickly gather clients who were social service agencies, ch both children's especially and adults, and then uh, adoption agencies, and then scores of practices of psychiatrists and psychologists and clinical social workers. And they needed me not just for boring legal work, like we need a new lease, we're moving from this building to that building, fine but for interesting stuff like, whoa, I just heard this story in clinical session and I don't know whether I should call the police or call social mm -hmm. services. I think there is a child abuse taking place here or elder abuse. So they, they needed a lawyer to call. And since I was the only lawyer in town with a PhD and the law degree, I sort of got all that business by default. And when they would call, they would tell the basic story of the client and then ask their legal question. So my file contained the basic story of the client. And some of those files are an inch thick and some of them are two feet thick, depending on what developed. Sometimes there was litigation. So those files form the, the body of data on which I now write, or from which I now write. And it's when I took a look at, um, at these files, going across the files, I discovered how much uh, loneliness was increasing as, a, um, as a, a mental problem presented to clinicians as the years went by. So the more current files kept having mention of loneliness, whereas earlier files, I had not been told that story by clinicians. And so I set out to study what my files had in them, and I decided to to write stories about them uh, rather than sort of lecturing away. And I picked what I thought were the most representative law cases that held within them, in the charming way a story tells a tells you a lesson, but without preaching it, um, of the different types of loneliness. So the 2016 book. Four Seasons of Loneliness is about people who get to chronic loneliness because they're so disconnected and isolated. And this new book that just came out May 1st is about people who are in relationships. They're married, they have kids, or they have neighbors or teammates or uh, friends, but they don't get anything. Those pipes don't carry any water. They're unsatisfying relationships to the point where people uh, report being chronically lonely, notwithstanding the fact that they're surrounded by others. So, well, I'm just going to give you an observation here before I ask you another question. I also want to welcome any questions that we haven't covered that anybody would like to bring up. This is another response from Lindsay Rood saying, I think healing from a broken heart is far more painful because the process of healing isn't always logical. Sometimes it takes a step backwards to take two forward. We are not always aware of the psychological depths to which a partner can reach until they are absent. Wow. So that's a big statement. So about logic, that's a good point. You said that we were intuitively kind of wired to connect. So right now, can you see why people would be breaking the rules in lockdown? Because it, even though they know it's perhaps illogical or not common sense, they just have to impulsively, intuitively connect with another person. Absolutely. The, the other, uh, oh, I don't know, a few weeks ago, I was driving uh, in, uh, along the, near the shore in uh, Massachusetts, and um, it was just dusk time. And my car, I was going very slow on a small rural road, and I, my car was coming up between one deer who was on one side of the road and his pod of other deer on the other side. And when he realized that this massive invas invasive, whatever a car is to a deer, 
was going to go between them, his head shot up with fear. He was just enervated by the, a signal of, of, of his distance and, and his separation from the safety of his, of his uh, group of other deer. That's who we are too. So being separated, being forced to be separated operates against our motivation. So it's no coincidence that we have pubs and cafes around the globe. Every culture, I've probably, like many people listening, traveled in a bunch of countries. Everybody has their way of doing, uh, getting together. When you think what a traditional market is, um, and it could be that, uh, from what I read, uh, that this disease began in a market in China, a so-called wet market. I remember going in northern Vietnam to a, a market like that that hadn't changed in 1,500 years um, in Sapa. There was a town near the Chinese border. And there are thousands of people for the Sunday market. And, they, and part of the pleasure of being there is to purchase your potatoes and your fish and your meat and everything you need. But another part is just being around all these other people, the souk in Arab culture, the uh, stores in French culture, the little markets that people mm -hmm. line up in and enjoy. Part of being, brushing up against other humans is just part of the kind of animal that we are. So it hurts to stay inside. And let me give you a fun example. In medieval Europe, the greatest punishment, if, if they didn't kill you, I suppose there were some offenses where they just do you in. But if, they, if, if it was south of that, if the seriousness of your transgression was south of, of, of that, the next worst punishment was banishment. They'd put you outside the walls of the city or town and tell you never to come back. And the pain of that is, is what I think we're all feeling to some extent. And it's absolutely wired, hardwired in us as the kind of mammal we are to want to associate closely with others, including strangers. And that we don't have right now. That is fascinating that you raise that because I always thought that banishment, until we talked about it, was really just a, an economic you know, uh, penalty. That if you were forced to be outside the tribe or the group, your chances of survival were slim because it was safer to be inside the walls of the castle. I never thought about the emotional uh, estrangement before, that that could kill you. And I guess it could. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a serious matter. Uh, yeah. Whether it can kill you or not directly, I don't know. But it, Well, it, certainly it you said it's a, it's a serious health hazard, right? In your book, you said it's on a par with obesity or other high risk uh, kind of conditions, correct? We have very powerful statistics backing that up, that uh, being chronically lonely is um, as bad for your health, is, is as associated with increased morbidity and increased mortality as, uh, what do they call it, um, very serious uh, uh, obesity or uh, multi-pack a day cigarette smoking. It, it, mm -hmm. it correlates very strongly with more illness and shorter lives. Hmm. Okay, we've got a couple of questions coming in. Can you suggest any reading matter on, ther on relational therapy? <laughs> yeah. I suppose you can. I can. Um, first place, um, the, uh, Dr. Amy Banks, uh, B-A-N-K-S, is a psychiatrist and has written a, a book, um, that's called we, we had her didn't we on the last program yeah. oh, uh, that's program. what you did it's yeah. called wired to connect the that's surprising that's link that's behind that. between brain science and strong and healthy relationships wired and to connect wired to connect it's really good and and it's it has in it a, a relational assessment chart which i'm also going to is, is uh, going up on my website in a, a paper mm. i just I just wrote, and if you take this, you can score your relationships. There's only 20 questions, and they're they're very they're, they're not surprising. They run like I I can I can count on this person to help me out in an emergency, or despite our different roles, we treat each other as equals. So there's 20 questions. Is mm -hmm. all it takes. They 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 make up four categories, which we can talk about if you like. 
and you go down your particular relationships in the column, Harry, Louis, Sally, so on, and you score how you're doing, one through five. It's amazing. You can, when you're done with this, if you're honest with yourself and you take your time and you put in the honest answers, you'll see how each relationship is doing in each of these four sectors of what makes relationships work. And then across them, you'll see how you're doing as a, as a uh, friend in general across all of your relationships. Um, it'll be up uh, on the, the lonelinessbooks.com, my website, um, in a day or two. And, um, but the full treatment of it is, it, it's from Amy Banks' wonderful work, and you can find it in the book I cited. And we can um, post these links on our website after the program for people, including your website, www.loneliness.com. Oh, okay. Um, somebody's written here, Tony Akil. Uh, similarly, excommunication from various faith groups, emotional and social isolation from what was perhaps the singular group of support and encouragement for some. That leads to an interesting question about how people are dealing without their churches and their spiritual places during this. Um, a lot of people feel really cut off because that's their weekly thing that they go to a service and they connect with people in the coffee hour or whatever. So that's actually kind of an interesting thing about faith groups. Um, yeah, excommunication from a faith group. That, that was death in, in, in certainly in olden times, correct? Sure. Excommunication. That's a very interesting sub-question. Yeah. Um, oh, I wanted to ask you, um, you talked about the possibility or the need for somatic therapy. Um, and we know that talk therapy is very helpful with putting right things that are wrong. But since we now know that the neural pathways in the brain are made when we're very young, um, you know, is it, is it possible to rewire <laughs> the brain when you have these really deep, psychological scars um, from your childhood or relationships? I, th I think it's possible. I think it's a piece of work to underdo, undertake. Um, I'll tell you just a little story. I, I used to have, a, a, a years ago when I was in graduate school, I had an Irish setter, very pretty dog, but not very clever. But <laughs> I was determined to teach her to turn off the light by jumping up on the wall and pulling down on the switch. So I would say the word light, and I'd give her a cookie when I ran her paw over the light switch and eventually she learned that and then I had fun with my buddies they'd come over and I'd leave the light on on purpose and politely ask the dog to please turn the light off and she'd run and do it so what was going on well, how was that dog associating the stimulus and the response and the reward what was going on because the the a, dogs are language free anyways and, and that dog was not even bright for a dog uh sweet though she was <laughs> so what's going on? You know, physiologically, what's going on? And, and, and we know now uh, from the neurological imaging we're able to do that a pathway, a neural pathway, is actually being created by the repetitive stimulus response reward. So you're creating a neural pathway. It's sort of like if you crease the page, a page of paper over and over again, you make a crease in that paper and it's hard to get out right? Hard to smoothen out. So that's the way the neurology of our, of our, those parts of our brain that allow us to learn new stimulus response reward. So when a child is, is lovingly nurtured and held and kissed and soothed for all those years, that's what's going on. You're creating that neural pathway. Now, some parents aren't like that. Some children don't get the uh, playtime the free play at school time uh, that I was talking about in the introduction. So they don't further their relational skills. And other people who were raised by uh, loving parents and had the original pathways, had normal childhoods, learned how to, how to befriend others, uh, are disturbed by great trauma they run into, uh, not just in war, but in many spheres of life. So the question is, can one improve one's relational skills? So why not? But you have to you have to take it as 
a, is a deep structure issue. It, it's not just a matter of um, don't put too much air in your tire or you'll wreck the thing, put in less, fine, got it. I, you know, the hint, no problem. Crazy this, fix. This, uh, this is much deeper, but yes, there's no reason in the world, to the extent we learn other things as we age, we can relearn how to connect with others if we pay attention to the task. What was it you were telling me about the wire, the monkey with the wire? Um... Oh, that's the famous Harry Harlow experiment where um, monkeys, because uh, and they chose a type of monkey that is that to more closely related, actually. Uh, and these little monkeys, um, when they were, he had them raised on a wire mother. In other words, he they took wire and formed the shape of a of a parent mother monkey. Uh, and they had another one, uh, uh, and that's where the bottle was that they could nurse from. And then they had a soft uh, um, dummy mo uh, mother with no milk. And the monkeys would only go to the wire monkey to nurse, to, to suck on the bottle. As soon as they were done, they'd go over to the soft mother Amazing. substitute. So, yeah, we're built to seek this kind of physical touch and nurturing. Mm -hmm. The monkeys are, and so are we. Mm. Uh, a lot of uh, comments here, over here, from Tim. What about loneliness and the sector of education? Educators have long recognized that most of the process is one of lateral learning. That is students learning from other students and peers rather than just through textbooks or lectures. How do you think the patterns of learning will change under the increasing trend you and identify of increased loneliness will all of us from the early school years through k through 10 through college be driven onto the socially isolating experience of a zoom <laughs> world for learning wow well that's uh, that certainly is is something that could happen if this virus turns out to be highly problematic uh in the long run i.e if there's if they can't uh, come up with the um, with the um, vaccine, um, or if we don't develop immunity or, or herd immunity. Uh, imagine if this if this is here for the long run. Mm -hmm. um, then uh, I think the gentleman brings up some very interesting points. It will very much change education. I was speaking to a niece of mine who's a third grade. Well, she must be thirty years or about thirty years of experience as a third grade teacher, and of course they're doing that. Uh, um, as we are over Zoom, uh, trying to do that and with the little kids. And the problems involved are just monumental. Um, being there in person, being a co-student with someone who listened to the same lecture and can help you figure out what the heck that professor just said, it's terribly important, as the question implies. And I think educational institutions are baffled right now about where they'll be heading in the fall. There's so many issues. Yes, I, I see that, well, our schools in Europe go to the end of July before they take the summer vacation. So many schools in England are planning to go back June 1st. And I think some in France have already gone back with isolating spaces. But it's difficult because the, the teachers unions now said it's safe for us <laughs> to go back uh, and teach. So I think we've got lots of concerns that are all kind of jostling for for attention and it's hard to get all of them addressed really uh, in a satisfactory manner absolutely but, uh, but i think education is an interesting one because um it isn't just a book because it was just a book we could have been doing it for years without teachers i think i just saw that the uh, california uh there are three levels of, of college in california uh, the university level, the, we used to call them the state colleges, mm. uh, and then the city colleges, which are two-year degrees. Mm. But the state college system, which is about half a million students per class per year, has just has already told its students they will not be opening in the fall. It will be electronic uh, uh, communication uh, between teachers, uh, professors, and students throughout the fall semester. Wow. Yeah, it's a wow. I wonder, is it going to still be the same price? <laughs> so, so are the parents of those students. <laughs> <laughs> That's an interesting. Okay, well, um, 
I don't know if we've got any more questions, Terry. I mean, we could, we could uh, keep going here, but I just want to make sure everybody who had their question or had their comments said their comments. And I think, I think we've answered everything here. I can't see any more. Well, um, I just want to make sure everybody um, knows uh, the title of your book, Surrounded by Others and Yet So Alone, is Terry's latest book. And it's available from Amazon. It's also available on his website, which I'm going to post on our website for you all to see, which is www.thelonelinessbooks.com. Um, okay, I'll ask my question over here. In most therapy, touch is not permitted. Is that a loss? It's a very interesting question because uh, over in the field of trauma therapy, they're, they're trying to deal with that because one of the techniques, for example, they use is, is theater settings. So you can assign someone a role that's chosen particularly for the issues they're dealing with to make them feel, for example, the opposite of what they usually mm. feel, whatever. And sometimes the roles in theater, after all, involve touch. So uh, who's touching? Is it the, is it the um, clients of the clinicians or is it the characters of the drama? Oh, wow. so it's, a, it's a brilliant question and it's mm -hmm. a very important question as we deal with some of these very deep kinds of memories that the body stores, whether from trauma or whether from chronic loneliness. Interesting question. Well, I just want to thank everybody for joining us today and for listening. Uh, that was wonderful, Terry. Thank you very much. Terry has been discussing lockdown Americans, isolation and loneliness in the 21st century. Um, Cambridge Forum is made possible through the generosity of Herbert and Dorothy Vetter. It's also sponsored by the Lowell Institute, Massachusetts Cultural Council, Harvard Bookstore and First Parish Church in Cambridge. I want to thank everyone for joining us. A podcast of this program will be available on our web website, www.cambridgeforum.org, shortly. And so will a video be posted on GBH Forum Network.